Okay. Um, good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers. And I am Sharon Sultan, and I'm the senior curator of the National Museum of Archaeology in Malta. Why is Amit? Well, basically, um, the Mr. Please Amit has been known in Malta as the father of Maltese archaeology. And he is the source for many researchers, basically many people, many researchers, both local and foreign, come to the museum um, to look through his notebooks and see his collections. Um, but basically, they are mostly site-specific. So someone would be um, studying one particular site and looking at the notebooks for the particular site. What I intend to do for my PhD, for which I have to submit a proposal soon, is basically go through the recording methodology of Zamit throughout his years and see the development of his, his recording methodology and his collections and basically the effect it had on, on the local um, archaeology. <clears throat> now, for those of you who might not be familiar with where Malta is, we're here. Yes. And the very tiny dot in the middle of the Mediterranean, yes, people live there. <laughs> I am one of the 475,000 people who live on that dot in the middle of the Mediterranean. And however, due, and even though it's very small in size, Malta is 27 kilometers by 14.5 kilometers. You can cross from the southern part of Malta to the northern part, basically 45 minutes by car. That's when there's no traffic. As you can imagine, Malta is overpopulated, and when there's traffic, it can take like three hours. So, however, due to its strategic position in the middle of the Mediterranean, basically Malta has been, um, since the Neolithic period, a haven for a lot of colonies. People coming and wanting to make Malta, you know, part of their colony, um, because it was, it, it has very good national, um, natural harbors, and obviously, it's in a very good position for them to be able, you know, to connect to other places. So, um, since the Neolithic period, we had, you know, Neolithic people coming over from Sicily. Um, they are basically our sort of first illegal immigrants. And basically, throughout the Bronze Age, Phoenicians, Romans, you know, it's, it's, it goes on. Um, until 1964, when Malta gains, gained uh, its independence. So all these people who came over and settled in Malta basically left us a, a wealth of cultural heritage, which nowadays uh, is regulated by the Culture and Heritage Act, which was enacted in 2002. But as we shall see, that was not always the case. What we have here is one of the um, what is Malta? What Malta is famous for the um, one of our Neolithic temples. This is Nigel temples, and basically we shall also see um, how how Temizamit dealt with protecting these sites. So, Temizamit, born in 1864 and he died in 1935. Basically, during this period, Malta was a British colony. It was a, a very important British naval. Um, site, um, and that scenario basically affected the way cultural heritage in Malta developed. Um, in the 1900s, in Malta, and even in other places, but especially in Malta, it was um, the turning point for, for museums and collections. And Planista Pizami was basically at, at the helm of this turning point. <coughs> Now, Temi Zamid, as he is more popularly known, um, was a doctor by profession. So um, he graduated in 1888 um, as a doctor. And in 1891, he was appointed the analytic chemist um, to the sanitary branch of the police department. And he held that post until 1920, when he became director of university. Um, in 1905, he discovered um, the cause of ambulant fever, um, which basically he realized that this was coming from unpasteurized goat's milk, and thereby you know. But um, his discovery was not immediately attributed to him, because basically there were a team of, of even British doctors working with him, so you know, um, it was only later that it, this discovery was attributed. 
in between, in 1903, um, he was appointed by the Lieutenant Governor Mirwether um, as temporary curator of Malta's first public museum, and also as secretary of the Committee of Museum Management. Now, um, a lot of people were against this idea of appointing Zamit as temporary curator, um, mainly because of all the commitments, and those are just a few. He was involved in so, so many other committees, basically of all the other commitments that, that he had. And um, Mirwether himself, um, who was convinced that Zamit was the best man for this job, basically said, and this is noted in one of the, of the committee meetings, that Zamit was to dedicate his spare time out of office hours when not employed in other government work, which does not sound, you know, doesn't go very well. Um, now, why was Zamit chosen? Basically, in 1901, um, as part of the imperial colonial tour, the um, Duke and Duchess of Cornwall and York were going to visit Malta as part of their tour. And uh, it had been taught to have a long exhibition. And Zamit, being the, sec the secretary of um, what was the Malta um, Committee for Arts and Commerce and Manufactures, basically he put um, together this long exhibition whereby he got people, private people, basically to, to loan artifacts for this exhibition. And this exhibition was considered to be such a success. Um, somewhere in the region of 1,000 paying visitors and a lot of other complimentary ones visited this exhibition which lasted only 10 days. So due to the success of the exhibition, they thought that Zamit would be able to continue with his, his work as, as curator of the museum. Now, what was the state of affairs before Zamit entered the scene? So basically, um, there was already a national collection which basically had been amassed uh, by the Vice Chancellor um, John Francisco Abella, who was the Vice Chancellor of the Knights of the Order of St. John. And since the 17th century, this collection had you know, been to various places, moving from one place to the other, and it was dispersing in auberges, in government departments, private hands, stolen, sold. I mean, we've, we've heard all this already. So it was um, basically the collection pre-1903 was housed in the public um, library, in the biblioteca, the, the public library. And it was called the Museum of the Public Library. Now it's public and it's a library. So the general public wouldn't have entered there. It would have mainly appealed in the 1800s to people of the academia. Only the learned were going to go inside the library. So it, it, even though it was a public library, it was definitely not accessible for all. So what did um, Zamit do? Be before that, I would like to point out, here there is a letter um, in one of the Maltese um, newspapers, which was um, written in 1891, whereby there was this person who wrote this article and that is written there, wanted a museum for Malta. And it's reproaching the Maltese public saying, listen, you should you know, be more proud of your cultural heritage and not let your collection disperse. So you need a national museum with someone who takes care of your collections. Now, when um, Zamit was appointed as part of his remit, I had to write what are called annual reports. And these are one of the sources of information that we have. So basically, his reporting about the collection that he found, basically, he points out that it was in just two rooms. And no serious attempt had ever been made to increase the collection or at least arrange and classify the exhibits in a manner to satisfy as much as possible the requirements of students and of the general public. And no effort to interest <coughs> the visitor in the museum or to indirectly attract public attention to it by loan exhibitions of objects of archaeological interests from numerous private collections, some of which are very rich. However, the thing that really, you know, irked Zamid was the lack of proper labeling, um, which definitely impaired the value of the collection. Now, in 1903, the collection changed hands and became the responsibility of Zamid. 
and he set up the first display two years later at Palazzo Sharon in 1905. Um, basically, as he himself reports in the Yankee reports, even though um, the building has had its own restrictions, like some of the museums in Malta still, still do, because they are housed in historic houses, um, he still managed to display as much as possible of the collection in a very systematic manner. And he also tried to make um, the collection as accessible to the public as possible. So he even commissioned scaled down models. Um, these are to the scale of 1 is to 30. Quark models of the meg megalithic remains, um, which were causing quite a stir in the Mediterranean at that point in time. Until now, these Neolithic remains were still thought to be Phoenician, dating to the Phoenician period. Um, so this really, you know, links with what you were saying before. Um, and in, in his, his guide, basically says, the visitor who finds no time to drive to the ruins can thus get a fair idea of these important megalithic buildings by simply visiting the museum. <clears throat> now, um, basically, and I will not go into this for, for basically a lot of time, um, he did have a very good relationship with the British authorities. And um, Lord Grenfell, who had been um, the Lieutenant General, basically when he relinquished his post, he left um, a great deal of his collection, his Egyptian collection, to the museum. And that is one of the plots we have, which is still in the museum, um, basically for, for the donation. And this um, started off a number of other donations. So by doing this, basically Zammit um, was raising a lot of awareness and in his several reports, there were a lot of, there are whole lists of people donating various artifacts to the museum. And in this manner, the collection was just growing exponentially. Which led um, to moving to another place. They basically had to take the collection and move it elsewhere. Um, and in 1992, the museum display um, moved to Auberge Italie. Um, these are all places in, in, in Valletta, which is Malta's capital city. And then again, through his guidebook, basically you can, we can see um, how he tried to make the collection as accessible as possible. Um, the guidebook, which is dedicated to Grandpa, uh, even comes with a, with a floor plan and you know, everything is marked. And there are also a lot of images of the sites. So um, each, each room had specific collections, chronological collections, but they were site specific. So for each um, showcase, you would have artifacts from the different sites, which would come with information about the site itself and leave with images of, of, the, of the site. So as to sort of put the artifacts into context. The sites were briefly described. When I say briefly, most of them were briefly, but for the sites he excavated, he fully excavated himself, they're more, much more detailed. And he also notes that if anyone wanted more literature, they could ask the custodian and he would readily supply them with more literature. So he was even um, taking care of different levels of, of information that would have been accessible to the public. And um, from, from his notebooks and from, from the annual reports, we basically realized that the displays were constantly being updated as, they were, as sites were discovered. So for those sites which he thought were important for the public to have access to, he was constantly updating the display. Now, apart from the displays, there are other sources from where we can get um, information about the ways on which work. You have his field notebooks, the annual reports, and his publications. Now, um, his field notebooks are the ones which enlighten, enlighten us most about his recording methodology. Um, most of them are very detailed, a lot of writing, um, very, very detailed drawings, most of them with measurements. Um, from which one could actually um, reproduce a site. In fact, we have done a similar reproduction um, in our museum whereby we took one of the um, sketches, ten examined sketches, sketches, and we could actually reconstruct the whole tomb with the artifacts which, which we know were pertaining to the tomb. In other cases, um, the information is very scanty, 
And in some cases, oh, like um, the question mark over there, it is very interesting to note. I just did a preliminary um, research about this, but I will have to go into more <coughs> depth. That um, in some cases, when there is a question mark, these will not feature in the annual reports. So one will have to see why that was happening. Um, one would also find other information, not actually pertaining to the excavations, but for example, um, how much a cab cost, a taxi. Dummy never drove, never learned how to drive. So, and how much the pottery costs, because um, as I will be saying a bit later on, basically uh, most of the times, pottery had to be bought from the landowners. <clears throat> Um, whatever was written in the field notebooks, mainly the main emphasis was on the collections. So um, we do have very detailed um, drawings, sometimes in watercolor, mainly, um, mainly in pencil, but then drawn over and in pen. And um, some of the artifacts from which we can basically even provenance when we have um, difficulties. Photography was one of his recording methods, um, and he used to annotate um, on the photos. We have thousands of glass negatives, which we're basically doing the conservation of. <clears throat> now, um, legislation at that point in time did not exist. So basically what was happening, whenever there was um, infrastructure buildings, a lot of material was coming out, and he was basically just doing rescue excavation. And um, in some cases, he would even choose just to take photos and not acquire the pottery. And the reasons for this would have been multiple. Basically, it's, um, it was lack of space in the museum, and here we already have um, notions of the accession, the accessioning policies, something which to date we do not have at the National Museum of Archaeology. Um, but he would still take photos of the artifacts which he would have left on site. And at this point in time as well, site, very important sites had, weren't even fenced over. So he was really pushing hard with the local authorities um, in order to have um, a legislation. In, 19, in 1910, basically, there was some sort of legislation which had a, lo a lot of loopholes. But basically, here Zamit was saying that um, he was pushing the government basically to um, uh, uh, reposition the, the, the land. So basically, the sites would be for, for the public and not, not pri in private hands. Um, and Basically, what he's saying is, owing to the excessive population and narrow limits of these islands, our monuments are in danger of being destroyed by ignorant people. He, he didn't use his words. Through carelessness, many interesting monuments have already disappeared, <coughs> but fortunately, many more still remain enough. Indeed, to make the Maltese Islands, from an archaeological point of view, the most conspicuous space in the Mediterranean. He was very proud um, of, his, of his heritage. He obviously made a lot of contacts with people abroad. Um, he took artifacts abroad with him whenever he visited places in order to get <coughs> feedback on the artifacts. Um, here we have you know, two people, Margaret Murray and Crawford. Margaret Murray affectionately says that um, his British friends refer to him as Temi Demit. Um, so basically um, what I went through was quickly um, what he did during his temporary employment, which eventually lasted over 30 years. And that's the end of it. Basically, there are a few suggested um, reading titles. And I do appeal that if any one of you um, <coughs> ever comes across anything related to it, um, lately we brought down notebooks which weren't known to be pertaining to Zamit from UCL because they were found in a cupboard somewhere. And so anyone who has any information can just send an email address. Thank you.